We were very strict with ourselves until we actually, six months after we initially came up with this idea, we were finally sitting down um, and in front of microphones and then we had, you know, then we had to tune up. I was thinking, maybe we start thinking about what we should be playing. No, 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 tune up, you know, and then finally, and then it was like, like go, play whatever comes into your head, which we did for two days in the beautiful environment of uh, Hamish's grandparents' house in a grand town in Spain in the Scottish Highlands in the depths of winter. So basically, um, we filled up my car, full to the gunnels, uh, and with all my gear, I think we took basically almost anything and everything that was sound related out of my flat. Road NT5s, AEA R92, Sure Unidime, DPA Fiddle Mic, Broadhurst Gardens, DAV 8x, preamps, RME preamps, Adam Speakers P11A, Mac laptop, headphones, speakers, baffles, stands, notepad, fiddle, personal bags, two folk musicians, all the sh**. In the whole history of traditional music, the idea of putting together arrangements purely for listening to is very, very, very new. Mm. It's like this music's been dance music for ages. And um, <clears throat> people have been putting chords to it, sure, but actually going beyond that, that's in, only in the last 20 or 30 years, so I would say that's more... Arranging traditional music is far more radical than what we're doing, which is just jamming it, old style. <laughs> Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia in Canada, the way they used to make records was they would just sit a microphone on a table at a party and uh, my dad's got some of those recordings and you can just hear folk chatting in the background and like mm. having a party and someone was striking out with a fiddle so personally I kind of always quite liked that, I mean that's just a recording of traditional music and I guess we just tried to do a bit of that, I mean it's almost like a field recording yeah. as opposed to making an album. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's quite exciting as is well known to 
buy a record, listening to a band, playing arrangements, the whole world seems to be quite keen on that. But uh, what about buying a record where you, or a field recording, where you don't listen to musicians playing an arrangement, you listen to them coming up with an arrangement. Yeah. The actual moment of creation yeah. on a record. Sometimes, when you're trying to play music, if it's not predetermined, you're not actually very good at it. And but when you do nail it, then yeah, it's we, a much better feeling, isn't it? It's like I think there's a sheer joy that I hope that we've managed to capture. when things that we would never have come up with in a rehearsal situation if we were jamming you know we yeah. might we i'm sure i'm sure that there are ideas that we came up with on the spot or we kind of had to come up with on the spot <laughs> because we're under so much pressure in terms of well we didn't feel we, there was a, there was a pressure because we knew it was all getting recorded but then there at the same time there was you know we it didn't matter because we'd had so many train wrecks prior to that yeah. point There was the larger pressure, we were away, we were recording, but we were playing, there, was just, there wasn't really a pressure in a way because it didn't matter, we weren't trying to get a take, we were just playing whatever, so I think we were attempting to pull off stunts, which you would never try and pull off in a recording studio. process was a bit of relief actually it was, it was it kind of felt more satisfying to just it's almost a little bit like just letting things happen as they happen without forcing it and in some situations occasionally not, not, not often you might find yourself in a recording situation where you have to force to make the album work, whether it be business, uh, financially wise, you know, time time running out, you need to force the idea or, or make, make a track work. But I kind of felt for those two days, we just had a got that clean slate. We were just able just to sort of let music happen. Taste. Oh yeah. God, it's, I mean, real poor taste. Many. <laughs> awesome. I suppose we're not thinking we're trying to honour anything or or trying. We're not known preser for our pres our taste. <laughs> preserving yeah. anything. Or we are Scottish folk musicians, so we just play whatever we want because that's what people have always done. They just play what they want. We're not going to play uh, 
a slower twice because it normally gets played twice and that's the traditional way to play it. Mm -hmm. We'll play the first part and stop because that's what felt good at that moment. Yeah. That's the kind of, uh, and you know, if, uh, if folk are not into it, that's totally cool. <laughs> Spad, engineer, quote, Sometimes you just have to take on low-paying jobs to pay the bills. They made their music with reckless abandon, with no consideration for tradition, taste, or indeed the pair of ears that have to endure and engineer these servile, fawning parasites who call themselves musicians. <laughs> Are people going to be able to just like go out and buy a nice package CD with like loads of nice liner notes and credits and thank yous and... Well, first of all, I would just like to say as uh, the CEO of Airy Records, just how <laughs> very happy I am to be able to announce this exciting second release on uh, our small cottage label. And secondly, to answer your question, um, no. Okay, so the CD's not available. Um, there is no CD available.
So how did you enjoy working with uh, Hamish on Nay Plans Volume 1? Well, first of all, um, he's not just a formidable pianist. He is an incredible singer. I think Adam is one of Scotland's leading fiddle players. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, the tone, the beautiful caramel, kind of creamy uh, dexterousness with which he used his voice to achieve such subtle and yet definite emotional effect was spellbinding. I think there's various issues which he possibly needs to work on, for instance intonation and perhaps his harmonic knowledge. I'd sometimes be playing quite simple chords really um, and uh, I could tell that he had really no idea where I was going or what I was playing. Um, for me his attitude to the harmonic aspects of traditional music is just so energising. Uh, it's difficult at times when you have that you're working with somebody and you, you don't you want to keep the energy and the vibe up and you know that it's going so much better for them than it is for you. What I really love is just you know I get the feeling that he enjoys working with me it's not just one way uh, I would never say I would never ask him if he enjoyed working with me but I really feel like I'm getting that back from him is that this isn't just fun for me I'm like, this guy who I really respect, he's having fun. And that is a, you know, a, a quiet compliment. I, I did feel like walking out a few times um, during the recording process, but uh, I knew it was kind of that kind of way where it was too late to turn back. I don't think I've ever heard another singer in the Scottish folk scene who's really got the ability to, you know, make you, to bring you out of your day in a very arresting way and just make you realise, oh my God, I, I'm alive. He's quite self-involved in, in his music and uh, once he's going, he's not really listening to anybody else, um, which is quite apparent from several of the outtakes. Just, just a total joy again, I use that word again, but I'm afraid that is uh, a big word to use with uh, working with Hamish. It's a quite small, small word. I suppose. It could be big and big writing in the sky, written oh, by yeah, a plane. Yeah, font, like font size. That kind of joy. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Uh, I think the project was worthwhile. It was good to, to try it. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, maybe he needs to think about finding himself another accompanist sometime soon.